Hi, everybody. Welcome to Do-It-Yourself Cellular Intrusion Detection. My name is Sherry Davidoff. This is David Harrison, Randy Price, and Scott Fretheim. We're from LMG Security. So if your cell phone were hacked, how would you know about it? Probably half of you today in this room have cell phones that are hacked, uh, but you can tell. You can pick it up, you can look at it. The, um, the video that you see on the screen here, and I don't know why it's not displaying great resolution, sorry about that. Uh, the video you display on the screen here is showing us a video of a cell phone that's infected with the Android Stells malware. So what you see is um, sending data out to the Netherlands every five minutes or every 15 minutes, um, depending on whether or not it actually gets a response from the command and control server. And if you were a user looking at this phone, you would never know about it. There has been an explosion of mobile malware in recent years. I don't know if you've seen the Juniper paper on mobile threats. It was really good, very interesting. Um, and Juniper estimates that the number of mobile malware samples has increased 614% between March 2012 and March 2013. And it makes sense because when you think about it, these are just teeny tiny little computers that you're walking around with. They can record you, they can track you wherever you go, they can do anything that you can do with your cell phone if they get infected. This is a screenshot of TigerBot. TigerBot came out a couple years ago and it can record the surrounding audio in the room. Um, it can also track your GPS location and send it back to an attacker. Uh, I think it's really cool, cool and sort of scary where this is going because you can have botnets of infected computers, of course, on normal lands. And soon we're also going to see botnets of infected smartphones. When they came out with, with us, the Storm malware, uh, attackers can actually segment that malware into different nodes, so you have nodes communicating with different encryption keys. So if you have 10 infected systems inside one LAN and 20 infected systems inside another LAN, they're communicating peer-to-peer -peer with different encryption keys, and that means that an attacker, if they want to, can sell them off separately. Similarly, with smartphones, attackers will be able to identify mobile devices that are infected. They'll be able to tell what physical area they're in and segment them into different botnets for resale. So you could say, I have 10 devices, 10 infected bots inside this uh, Department of Defense building. I have 20 infected bots inside Hack Me Inc. How much do you want for them? Maybe they're worth different amounts to different attackers. Mobile malware can record surrounding audio. It can track you wherever you go. It can intercept text messages. It can send out your contacts list to the attacker, which is something we're going to show you later today. Um, and in doing so, they get more lists of people to attack the same way that spam works with normal email. We're probably going to see a lot more text spam the same way we see email spam. It can, of course, capture your passwords and keystrokes and control your phone or tablet in the same way you can. This is a chart that we made using the Argus tool of the phone home traffic for an infected black hole exploit kit. This was an infected laptop, and each one of those bars represents a time that it communicated outbound to the attacker's system. So this was over a 24-hour period. Um, all the normal Windows traffic has been pulled out, and you can see it phoning home to systems. Uh, actually, I think first it phoned home to Ohio, and then it switched IP addresses. You can see that little blip there. Uh, and it started talking to another system in Taiwan. The same thing happens with smartphones. Um, the Android Stells malware by default phones home, or at least the sample we were analyzing, phoned home every 15 minutes. So you would see a chart that looks very similar to this with your smartphone, and of course the user would never be able to tell. Now on LANs, enterprise security professionals have the option of inspecting network traffic. They can make charts like that. So even if there's no host space antivirus installed on a laptop, we can still tell if a certain laptop is infected based on the patterns of traffic that it's creating on the network. Um, we don't have that same option with cellular devices that are physically within our enterprises. And that means that people could be sitting in meetings, having their audio recorded, or just have devices that have um, corporate information on them. Or even in your home environment, this is also true. You might be sitting around having your audio recorded and never know it, or having your activity tracked, and you don't have the ability to inspect your traffic to tell if some third party, whether it's uh, an attacker, whether it's the government, is collecting information from your device and sending it outbound. Um, 
The problem is that cellular traffic is invisible to the key stakeholders who really care about those devices the most. Uh, one of the folks in our last um, talk asked if Verizon could tell if their phone was infected, and probably they could if they were inspecting that traffic, but they don't have the resources to be able to chase down every single infected phone. Nobody cares about your smartphone as much as you do, unfortunately. So what is the solution? Um, we propose a cellular intrusion detection system. Within the past few years, companies have started selling these little femto cells, basically miniature base stations that are designed to allow you to create stronger cell signals in places where you might not otherwise have them. They're being marketed to home users, so you can get one of these, plug it into the wall in your house, your cell phone connects to it, and then it routes that traffic across the internet back to your cell phone provider's uh, network. In this case, we were playing around with the Verizon Samsung Femto cells. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. This entire project to build a cellular intrusion detection system cost $285. We used both the Samsung SCS2U01 and SCS26UC4 devices, and it would probably work on other models as well. Our goal is to enable defenders and people like you and me to be able to detect when our cell phone is being hacked and when third third parties are monitoring our traffic. So we gained root on the commercial femto cell, the Verizon femto cell, and then we modified the Linux open source software on it um, so that it started exporting traffic, and David will go into this in more detail in a few minutes. Then we sent it off to a separate system, um, which embarrassingly only cost us $44 on eBay. It was an old Dell Optiflex. Uh, that system happened to be running, was running Snort and we created custom snort signatures so that we infected, when we infected a phone with the Android Stell's malware, uh, snort would actually detect it and alert upon it. So our roadmap for today, number one, we're gonna step through the femtocell modification process and show you how we did it so you can do it yourself. We're gonna show you examples of cellular traffic. We learned some interesting stuff from poking around. We're gonna do a demonstration in which we actually boot up the femto cell and show you how it gets modified in real time. And then we're gonna show you a little video of our experiment in which we infected a phone with the Android Stells malware, captured the traffic, and then used the Snort IDS to alert on malicious traffic. So you'll see those alerts pop up. Then we're gonna do a detailed walkthrough of the Android Stells malware and show you how it communicates. And finally, Scott and uh, Randy Price did the device forensic analysis, so she'll show how it corroborated with the network forensics. And Scott Fretheim is gonna show you how he took over the Android Stells malware and controlled it. So we got a lot to cram in here. There's also a detailed white paper that we put up. It's 77 pages, lots of information for you afterwards. lmgsecurity.com slash blog. So who are we? We are LMG Security. We're a security consulting and research firm. We kind of support our research habit by consulting. We do penetration testing, vulnerability assessments, digital forensics, and more. We also teach the Black Hat Network Forensics class, and that's part of where the idea for this project was born, because we thought to ourselves a couple years ago, hey, mobile network forensics, that's the wave of the future. Let's just grab some packet captures on cellular networks and start studying them and write a class about it. Uh, and it turned out it wasn't so easy. It's actually hard, really hard, to get access to this stuff. If you have $300,000 to spend, you can probably get some telecommunications equipment, but that's not really an option for most of us out there. Our core project team, myself, I'm the founder and senior security, senior security consultant and the author of Network Forensics, Tracking Hackers Through Cyberspace. David is our lead research scientist. Randy is our certified forensic examiner. And Scott is the head of our penetration testing team. I really want to get, give a big shout out today to ISEC Partners. Thank you guys so much for lending us some of your hardware to use for this demo. We really appreciate it. So here's the parts list. This is all you need to make your own cellular intrusion detection system. First, you need a femto cell. You can get it used. Um, the one that we used as an example was $200 even on eBay. We had a Dell Optiplex uh, GX260. Um, it was also used. It cost $44, including shipping. Obviously, if you want to, you can get some beefier hardware, but that was totally fine for our purposes. Um, we have a hub. A hub is really nice to have in our lab. Or it's a real hub. It's an old hub. Um, more valuable to us than switches because it makes sniffing on, on the wire a lot easier. We have an FTDI friend from Adafruit, um, and that lets you connect to the console port on the femto cell, and then a couple of cables. 
So that's it, and some magic, which we'll talk about today. So a little introduction to the Android Stells malware, which is what we're gonna focus on. Um, it came to public attention in March of this year, so just a few months ago. Uh, and it's distributed by spam, um, spam email, so people click on a link. The one that Dell SecureWorks wrote their research paper on was an IRS spam. Once you click on the link, uh, so it's distributed through the same channels as some other malware. Normally, they use the black hole exploit kit to infect systems, but that doesn't work on Android devices. So in this case, they're using a fake Flash Player update, and people fall for this all the time. Um, you click on the link, it says, sorry, you need a new version of Adobe Flash Player in order to read this file, and then it shoots you to a page that looks like an Adobe page. And the user just sort of walks through the installation for the attacker. Stells is capable of monitoring SMS messages and also filtering and intercepting SMS messages. This isn't, um, this isn't surprising because ever since banks started coming out with out-of-band authentication, uh, like you go to log into your bank's website and then sometimes it'll send you a pin to your phone, right? So if an attacker has, um, an attacker can insert information into that web page as they're doing a man in the browser attack and also ask you for your phone number. And when they do that, you type in your username, you type in your password, you type in your phone number, they hack your phone, and then from that point on, they filter messages going to your phone. So they can grab those pins as the banks send them to you. So there's direct financial incentive for attackers to be targeting your phones and, and linking them with your PCs. Um, and the benefit that they gain from actually filtering messages so that you can't see some of them is that you won't know if somebody's trying to if someone's trying to get into your bank account because it would be kind of funny for you to see all of a sudden a text message with the pin for your bank when you weren't actually trying to log in. So they filter that so that you can't see it. It can make phone calls and it can send SMS messages to premium numbers. Again, direct financial incentive for the attacker. And as we'll see later, it can also update itself. So any behavior that we don't see in it right now they could totally add tomorrow. The behavior of this malware could completely change overnight if someone wanted it to. This is our RF shielded cage. As we were doing this research, um, we really wanted to do it right. And so we consulted with legal counsel extensively and we also wanted to make sure that no one else's cell signals could possibly be captured as we were taking these packet captures. This device is something we normally use in our cell phone forensics lab. We have the only RF shielded cell lab, cell forensics lab in the state of Montana. Um, it includes AV so you can actually see into the box, which is kind of cool. And you can record it. So David, do you want to talk about the ports? So yeah, let's talk a little bit about all this stuff you see up here on stage. Um, so the RF shielded cage here, um, we're using, as we said, out of an abundance of caution as, so we don't end up accidentally capturing your traffic. Now, these femtocells can be configured to only connect to certain phones. Um, but in addition, we wanted something that was an absolute guarantee that we wouldn't accidentally get someone else's traffic that wasn't ours. So on the side of this box here, uh, you can see uh, there's a number of configurable ports, uh, the first of which uh, is currently set to be a Ethernet jack, a filtered Ethernet jack for uh, the backhaul to Verizon's network. We then have, or sorry, we then have a USB port um, that connects to the FTDI friend that's inside that we will use for serial communication. We also added, um, on the instructions and with the help of the manufacturer, Ramsey, um, added a SMB connector so that we can route GPS in. One of the requirements is, um, and one of the challenges of doing this demo in a, inside of the middle of a hotel is that uh, you need GPS lock in order for the femtocell to boot up. Um, so we had to run a GPS signal inside the cage. Let's see. So what's our setup look inside of here, like inside here? This is the other side of the, uh, the exact other side of those ports. We've got that GPS antenna, the um, Ethernet cable, and the cable running to the USB cable running to the FTDI friend, which then has a little hack together custom breakout to a uh, HDMI cable where uh, Samsung put the serial console. Um, on two ports of an HDMI, or two pins of an HDMI port that's in the bottom of the thing. Um, you can also see we have power and such in here. Let's see. So, cellular intrusion detection. Um, 
this wasn't originally, like when we set out to do this project, we were looking at network forensics, like, hey, let's see what we can see about the, um, the cellular network. Um, and it quickly became this big project to uh, even get access to it. So as soon as we did get access, we said, okay, what can we do? And we thought, oh, here's something cool, let's set up a cellular IDS. Um, we can hook it up to Snort. Uh, this is just going to be regular internet traffic at some level, we assumed at least at the time. Um, let's hook it up to Snort and see what Snort can find, if it can see, um, if it can see malware and see command and control traffic. So when we first got root access on this thing, which we'll step through how we got root access here in a minute, we just hooked up TCP dump to it because it actually has a copy of TCP dump. Um, the box itself, uh, the femtocell itself runs uh, a version of Linux called Montevista. And so we're like, okay, let's capture some traffic. Turns out that, of course, everything is um, encrypted using I, uh, an IPsec tunnel back to Verizon's core network. Um, and just running a TCP dump just gets us a whole bunch of, you can see the IS camp and the DNS, so not too useful to us. So to step backwards a little bit, how do we get root access in console? On the bottom there's a um, HDMI port. Um, it has 3.3 uh, .3 volt uh, console access on pins uh, 16 and 17. We hook that up to an FTDI friend from Adafruit, um, just an adapter for USB. It's like $15 part or something. But the thing was, I got really antsy while we were waiting for the shipping for this, and this was right after DEF CON last year. So I just grabbed my badge from last year, and since it had an FTDI uh, <laughs> connector on it, I just ended up using that one. Um, it's a little bit of a hack together solution, but I thought you'd enjoy that. So um, as soon as we uh, got console access, we find, oh, their first layer uh, on here is, of the stack is a U-boot bootloader. Um, Samsung's done a little bit to modify the U-boot bootloader. Um, they uh, have published their source code since it's GPL licensed. You can go to their website and download it. Um, and in the old versions, and old being this time last year, um, up through like mm, January or February of this year, um, all you had to do to interrupt the boot process was uh, instead of hit any key, you would type SYS return. And <laughs> the thing is, the code for that was in um, uh, Samsung, in Samsung's published source code. So, and we actually didn't figure that out. That was um, another gentleman who I'm spacing his name, but it's in our white paper, um, linked to his blog post about it. So we took that and okay, we've got uh, root access. Um, so then we just did init equals bin sh as to get um, uh, root access. And then uh, we stepped through the uh, boot up process manually the, since the init scripts don't run. Um, we then started looking at the, ser at the uh, networking connections. We saw there's DHCP going on, there's the VPN tunnel that I talked about a little bit ago, um, and it has IP tables. It's using that to filter out certain, um, so that only Verizon addresses can connect to some of the services, but we're like, hey, since uh, we saw a TCP dump wasn't working, let's see if we can get access through um, IP tables. Immediate, so that was a good enough idea, but the problem was that what's on there is very bare bones implementation of uh, IP tables 137. Um, no NFQ, no T command, no way to copy off and route traffic. There's not even a logging facility built in. It's an embedded system, it's not that surprising. So we went back to Samsung source code again. And so we really want to use NFQ. Uh, we grabbed the source code from their site. It's, uh, however, it doesn't want to compile with modern versions of GCC. Um, 
So it's really picky about only compiling with MontaVista's uh, ARM tool chain. Now, that encountered the next problem, which was that MontaVista doesn't openly, despite everything being GPL licensed, they don't uh, openly distribute that. They only distribute their tool chain and such to uh, vendors and their direct customers. However, one of the customers is uh, Texas Instruments who makes uh, the OMAP series of boards which often use MontaVista Linux. So the OMAP, I think it's L137 um, development board uh, uses the same version of MontaVista Linux as this does. The chipset in here is actually an OMAP 1710 which is a very similar Texas Instruments related board. So if you go to the TI website you can grab the uh, tool chain for uh, MontaVista Linux. We use that to then build the kernel modules for NFQ and all of its dependencies like Contract and such. So we got all those binaries. Um, NF, what NFQ does, if you're not familiar with it, it, it pulls uh, packets out, it route them to, it, with a rule in IP tables, uh, send them to Q0 or Q1. Um, then you have a user space program pull off the uh, first one in the queue, mark it as, do whatever you want to with it. You could modify it, send it back. In this case, we're just marking it as accept this packet, sending it back, and then sending a copy of it out to standard out, which we'll then type to um, uh, netcat and do fun stuff with here in a minute. So, oh yes, here's all that stuff I was just talking about. Got ahead of myself. Uh, kernel module. Um, you know, IP tables. So um, we wrote a little C program that we just then compiled statically for ARM that just pulls those, uh, the packets out of the queue, sends them off. Um, this is an ARM 926EJ processor. What we did for cross, rather than dealing with cross compilers was just started up a Debian ARM uh, emulator in Kemu. I found that to be a much simpler solution for compiling binaries because you don't want to, cross compiling makes my head hurt sometimes. Um, so the netcat, oh, we wanted to get traffic off of this thing as quickly as possible. It doesn't have much power. It's a pain to work with. Word to the wise, if you do this, um, there is n by default, uh, control C is not bound to sig term. Do not run ping. <laughs> at least not without, without a count flag or something, or you will have to reboot the whole thing. So I was like, oh my God, I really want to get uh, this traffic off of here as fast as possible. Send it to Netcat, and we'll do the rest of our processing on some other system, and originally that old Dell Optiplex. So um, we can see on the other end, we set up just a Netcat listener, which pipes to that small, uh, pretty small Python program that leverages Scapy and uh, libpcap to just take the raw stream um, because NFQ exports as a hexadecimal stream um, and convert that into a pcap which we then just write to a file. And hey, lo and behold, we had working um, traffic. And then we looked at that traffic and uh, <laughs> let's let Sherry talk about that. Um, it took us about, I got a mic. Uh, so it took us about 10 months to get to this point where we had traffic. We were a little bit slowed down. We started the project in August, and by February we had accomplished all this and we were just about ready to hit enter and start collecting packets when Samsung upgraded the software. And um, we had to actually break back into the system in order to regain access. Uh, and we did figure out how to do that, but it took us a little time. So by the time we were actually able to inspect cellular traffic, it was around May. And um, when, when we finally got it, it was, it was beautiful. <laughs> so this is um, the first of four slides that I'm going to show you of a single Wireshark protocol hierarchy summary. You can see here, um, this is just the basics. It's all IPv4. There's 82.04% of the bytes were UDP. And then you see uh, normal traffic that you might expect for managing a remote system, so NTP, SNMP, DNS, ICMP, that kind of stuff. You scroll down, okay, you start to see TCP, that's 0.21%. I was pretty intrigued to see some clear text FTP traffic in there. 
And then we start getting into the, the madness, the mirror world. Uh, there's GRE, so that's used to tunnel layer two PPP traffic from um, the femtocell over to Verizon's core network. And then you see, I don't know if you can see here, UDP in IPv4 in PPP in GRE. Okay, I can handle that. Here's the next screen. <laughs> All right, so we have TCP within IPv4, within PPP, within GRE. And this is where your web traffic lives, right around here. Um, so we can, in some cases, in some cases, Wireshark can actually dissect that far and can pull out some of the higher layer traffic. And then we go down here. You see TCP in IPv4 in PPP, in TCP in IPv4 in PPP, in GRE in IPv4 in PPP, in GRE in IPv4. And we're not done. <laughs> I don't know how far this rabbit hole goes. It just kept going and going and going. Um, so David didn't believe that this was actually real. I just figured it was some kind of a bug or something, wire shard. Yeah. So he made me go find some of these packets. Oh, Here's works. an example. This is uh, data in TCP and IPv4 and PPP, in TCP and IPv4 and PPP, in data, in PPP, in GRE, in IPv4, in a frame. Keep in mind, this is before it gets stuffed into an IPsec tunnel and sent across back to Verizon. <laughs> yeah. And I know the ISEC partners guys were tethering all of this over another phone also, so. Sounds like Dr. Seuss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have Dr. Seuss, yep. <laughs> so <clears throat> here's an example of the FTP traffic that we saw. It seems to be used for routine, and we're not going to dig into this stuff too much. It seems to be used for routine communications between the femtocell and Verizon. So it'll go out and, and this is all automated. It'll enter a password to an FTP server and pull down some configuration files, for example. So I just thought that was kind of neat to see the reconstructed stream here. Um, the phone does mobile handset authentication using PPP chat. Uh, it's a challenge authentication response protocol, and we were able to write snort signatures based on that. So that means that any time the phone joins the femto cell, we have a little snort alert that pops up. Um, the, the string that the Verizon network responds with is, welcome to the Samsung BSS something something. Um, so you can tell as soon as there's a new device connected to your femto cell, which is kind of handy, especially if you do end up deploying this on your home network or on an enterprise network. And you can restrict it also so that it only connects to specific uh, phones as well, which I would recommend doing if you're inspecting traffic, of course. So we also wrote a custom CDMA 2000 protocol dissector, and CDMA 2000, of course, is extremely complicated. Um, and our efforts in this respect were hampered by the fact that Verizon um, didn't seem to be using the latest version of the standard, so we had to go digging through and figure out exactly which version of the standard that it, it was using. Um, this is an example of the CDMA protocol dissector dissecting an A8 setup A9. So that's used to set up uh, set up interfaces which are used to transfer user data. And this is available on SourceForge. As soon as we get to a clean network, so probably tomorrow when one of us is home, we'll upload this stuff. Um, we ended up examining the Android data traffic most of all, and that's because the malware that we're using, Android.stells, actually transmit uh, signals back to the attacker over HTTP. So we wanted to be able to pull out that HTTP traffic and analyze it and figure out how the bot was working. There were two kinds of um, GRE packets that we saw, and Wireshark was dissecting them differently. This was a default version of Wireshark. There was GRE type 8881, which is not the one I like. Um, it is a CDMA 2000 A10 unstructured byte stream packet, and this was used for outgoing HTTP requests. Wireshark didn't dissect this at a very high layer. Um, however, there were also GRE 88D2 packets which were used for incoming HTTP requests, and Wireshark did decode more. It could get all the way up to TCP, so it got IP and then TCP. It still didn't get the HTTP in most cases, but what that meant was that when we looked at this first in Wireshark, um, we saw uh, we saw incoming TCP segments, and there was no matching outgoing TCP segment until we started dissecting it with our eyeballs. So that was a bit of a pain. Um, I think I have to step down to actually be able to point at things. Yeah. 
Sorry, sound engineer. Okay, so here you see, can everyone hear me? Here you see a Jiri type 8881 packet. And you can see that Wireshark only dissects as far as that PPP. It doesn't dissect the IP or the TCP. So we started looking a little further, and you see here that 4500, right? Anybody in our network class, our network forensics class, know what the 4500 is? This should, yeah, it's the start of an IP packet. Um, that 4 represents the version number, so in this case it's IPv4. You're probably only going to see either 4 or 6 there. The 5 represents the length of the IPv4 header, the number of 32-bit words. So in this case, that's a 20-byte IP header, which is very common because that's the default. And then here's the type of service field, which you see 00. So anytime you start looking at this hex and you see a 4500, you should think, aha, maybe that's an IP packet, and dig a little further. And that's what we did. And we saw that indeed it was. You could actually see the source IP address, the destination IP address. You could see the port. For a Ninja Duck, what is hex 50? What's that in decimal? 80. Awesome. Hey, David, can you give that guy a Ninja Duck? Okay, so there actually was traffic in here that should be dissected. I'm not sure why Wireshark can't pick up on it, but it can't get very far in that crazy layering scheme. And then here's the 888D2 packets, and you see it gets further. There's the point-to-point -point protocol, there's the IPv4, so it actually got it this time, and then there's the TCP segment right here. And you can see inside, there's actually HTTP traffic inside of that right here, HTTP, and higher layer stuff. It didn't get that far with the 88D2 traffic, but it was useful that it, it could at least dissect as far as the TCP segment. So here are some threat indicators um, that Dell SecureWorks put together for the Android Stells malware. You can see that um, it, so Android.Stells has specific command and control servers that are known. Uh, there's 31.170 something something. That's a server in the United States, actually. And then the other one, 95, is a server in the Netherlands. There's also a file name that Android.Stells is typically distributed, flashplayer.android.update.apk. And there's two domains that are in common use right now the freeiz.com one and the androidflashplayer.net.ua one. So those were things that we incorporated into our snort alerts. Here's some snort alerts um, that we use to detect activity with the Android Stells malware. This one, possible CNC server traffic. We put the IP addresses in here, but you can't just um, look for an IP address uh, the way you normally would look for an IP address in an IP packet in Snort, because of course Snort can't dissect all those crazy layers. You actually just have to look at it as a hexadecimal string, which we did, as you can see right here. So hopefully that's going to pop up in the content of a packet. It doesn't always, sometimes it's going to be fragmented across multiple packets, but we found that this actually worked most of the time. Same thing here, you see detecting domains. Again, we have to look for it uh, as a string in the packet, and because these are longer, they're more likely to be broken up across multiple packets. Um, we saw, in particular, we would see DNS, DNS responses containing this, these uh, domains, but usually the DNS requests, the domain was broken up across two packets, so Wireshark would show you that there had been a DNS, or I'm sorry, Snort would show that there had been alert on the response and not on the request. And then if you want to detect the binary, of course, we could take a snippet of the binary itself and have snort alert on that, and that worked really well. So you can see, before a user even infects themselves, you can see when they're downloading that Flash Player update. So now we're going to do a little demonstration. Um, in our lab, uh, I was the attacker. Um, and the attacker can be any phone. In this case, it was just an AT&T smartphone that we used to differentiate from our Verizon phone. And with the AT&T smartphone, we sent a nasty text message. And David was the victim. Aw, sad day. Yeah. So the victim, of course, was a Verizon Android smartphone because we wanted it to be infected. So now let's switch over to our box. Well, this is the boot up part of the demo, right? Yeah, we're going to do the boot up part of the demo. Okay. We need yes. our lab codes. Hold on. Lab codes. Safety first. That's mine. Who buttoned this thing? 
someone's trying to sabotage me. Darn you about mics. Here you go. Sorry for switching again, audio engineer. I know that's a pain. I used to do that for a living, so. So, all right, as soon as uh, you, okay, yeah, we have this here up on the screen, and I'm actually going to restart this femtocell. Don't worry, we're not setting this one up all the way. It's not going to capture traffic. So if you've got an Android phone out there, don't worry. So as soon as we plug it in here, we're going to see uh, the Onand, I don't know if you can see it before it scrolled off the screen, but the um, U-boot bootloader that's been modified by Samsung here. And we've already set it to drop us into the command prompt. Um, and let's see. So if you would type. Yep. Oh. I'm going through our script. Cool. So onand boot. Yes. So onand boot is a command that they added because uh, the uh, chipset on there uses the NAND uh, software, or the NAND flash memory that's proprietary to Samsung. They added in support for that. Um, here we see we've now dropped into a um, root we've shell, but very little set up because we didn't actually run the init scripts. So, so now, now we're running the init scripts. Yep. Now we're running all these init scripts. Most of this is standard stuff. Uh, there's a couple at the end there that we're not running. Um, there's one S70 app that uh, actually starts up the functionality for the uh, uh, cellular traffic. Um, and so we're choosing because we have a couple of things to do before we actually run that. Uh, one of the other little things that's a quirk of this system is uh, not everything's accessible until you run some of those scripts because of the way Onand works, it's um, split up into a whole bunch of different uh, blocks and block devices. Um, Extract rfs.sh. Yeah, and what we have to end up doing is uh, mounting those devices and then merging that and symlinking them to the places they're supposed to be in the file system. So, for instance, slash ubin contains lots of the uh, actual cell phone functionality, but that's not mounted until you run some of these init scripts, rfs.sh. So, let's see. What are we seeing here? So now we're running our final oh, yep. init scripts here. And then we're going to set up networking. And the reason we set up networking is because we have to download those extra binaries that we've compiled for the system and need to copy over. Yep. Fortunately, there are some, you know, standard tools. FTP is on here. So we're going to use that to connect. That's the address of this guy right here. Um, going to say, uh, CD over to where our binaries are, and the binaries we're downloading are the um, configure or the uh, kernel modules, the uh, packet capture little compiled binary that hooks into NFQ, and um, a binary for uh, netcat. And that's really all we need to move over. We've also got a script there that will make the rest of this easier, so we don't have to keep copying and pasting mm -hmm. every single command. So we're going to run that script. It is going to print all the commands we would run so you we're can going, see them. We're insmodding our kernel modules. Yep, we put all the kernel modules in. Order is important here. If you do those out of order, prerequisites won't work. We're going to start the VPN back to uh, Verizon's network. Yep, this just runs these two binaries here, the SSH and the VPN binary, are um, something uh, Samsung put on there. They just automatically configure a connection back to Verizon. And this usually takes um, a couple minutes. It actually sets up, tears down, sets up, tears down, grabs um, like NTP, and then tears down again, and then sets up um, its final connection. Um, so next. So then we kill the VPN and we kill the SSH. Yep. And then we start the Netcat listener on the SIDs. So at this point, we're waiting for that traffic to be shipped over. And as soon as I hit over, the traffic that's being collected from the femtocell is going to start being sent over to the SIDS. So press enter to start exporting packets to the SIDS. And there we go. We add a whole bunch of, here's the IP tables rules. It's really important 
to put in accept rules for that netcat tunnel. Otherwise, you're going to be capturing the capture that you send out and you end up with a little, like, nasty little recursive loop and an infinite sized file pretty quick. Um, okay. So then you hit enter to actually start the GPS and the call routing functionality. And as we were testing the system, of course, we wouldn't always want to start the call routing functionality right away. Sometimes we were just working on the underlying system. Um, and it can take a few minutes for that piece of it to start, but you see right here, now our, if you look at the size of the PCAP that's being captured, that's increasing, and that's what you want to see. And when you make a call, it's going to be added to that PCAP file. And it can take up to 30 minutes. It requires a correct GPS lock, and it requires um, an internet connection that it likes, so it can establish a good VPN connection, and then it will sit and think for like sometimes 30 minutes, an hour, um, mm -hmm. before it will actually uh, have the connection all set up. So then, um, once you have that packet capture file set up, you can use this tail command uh, and pipe that directly into Snort. So Snort is reading from that PCAP file in real time, and we've uploaded the rules that we want on there, and you can see it loading. Commencing packet processing, that means we're all good. Yep. So now we're gonna switch over to a little video where we show you us actually infecting the phone. We were hoping to do this here, but we've had some video issues, so we're just gonna talk you through it. So you just watched us start up Snort, and here's what our screen looks like. Oops, yep, you KBM can see. button. KVM, that would help. Good, okay. So you've just watched us start up Snort, and here's what the full screen looks like. In the top left, you can see Snort running. Uh, that second window down there, is actually the serial connection to the console port on the femto cell. Um, here, if I hit play, you'll see, you'll start to see the file size of that increase over time, and then we have our netcat listener down there. Now this is a phone starting up inside our cage right here. So this is recorded using that audio visual device. And this is David. Compressed for time. Compressed for time. This is David, our victim, clicking or starting up the phone. We're also watching for snort alerts as they come in. And you'll see as the phone starts up, boom, right there, our snort alert tells us, um, hey, welcome to, uh, welcome to the network, basically. We know that there's a new phone on the network. So jumping ahead a little bit, we got a text message. David, you got a text message. Yay. Someone says, hey, check this out. It was sneakynet.com. And we're gonna go, poor David, is tricked into clicking on the link. Now usually you're gonna see this be a flash player update with the Stells malware. It looks like this person was a little more creative. Um, that actually said, we'll go back a second. So this attacker was more creative. It said, would you like some candy? And David, David wanted some candy. I love candy. <laughs> and as soon as he clicked on that and the, the malware started downloading, you see, boom, Android Stells known malware binary snippet. So it detected that binary just based, on, just based on the binary traffic. So now the user installs it. It always boggles my mind that this works so consistently, but you know, users know they have to download and install their updates. We try to train them. And here's, us in, here's David installing the update. Now, it warns you that this, uh, that this malware wants a lot of permissions. Permissions to make phone calls, per permissions to send and receive text messages, that kind Whatever. of stuff. <laughs> who, who actually reads all that stuff? Yeah. Now the application is installed. And funny, we got this little message that says, your Android version does not support this update. Setup is canceled. So the user will say, damn it. Uh, or sorry, darn it. <laughs> and and I guess Flash Player hasn't actually been installed. So the application which appeared briefly on the desktop actually disappears, but it is still running as we're gonna see from the command and control traffic. I believe it takes, was it 60 seconds? Yeah, 60 seconds for the first connection back to CNC. Right, so here in a minute, yep, there you go, right there, possible CNC server traffic. So to the user, I've zoomed in here, to the user it doesn't look like anything has happened. Um, but here you see possible CNC ter server traffic, and it's talking to that system in the United States, 31.170.161.216.
And here we also see a post from the infected client. That's because Android Stealth communicates using, in, using HTTP post me messages. And we found some unique strings that um, allow us to tell specifically when it's an Android Stealth post. We're going to show those here in a few minutes. And I believe we're seeing multiple copies of the traffic just because of the way that we're sniffing. So that's something that we might want to uh, work on so that we're only seeing one copy. But we are sniffing on all the interfaces on the device. OK. So here again, that phone is just sitting there. And every 15 minutes, it sends a command outbound. But the, the first thing that happens is it sends that post command to 31 that system in um, the United States, and it got a response saying, okay, change the CNC server address. So next you see it start talking to um, a different server, that 95 IP address right here that's based in the Netherlands. And the, that 95 IP address said, remove SMS filters. So whatever SMS traffic was being filtered so that the user couldn't see it, it's removing those filters so now the user can actually see all of the traffic. That's nice. And then you saw a wait 900. Let me back up here. There we go. We saw a wait 900 command from our CNC server right here. That's 900 seconds or 15 minutes. So then we let this run for two days, and what we found was every 15 minutes, like clockwork, it was sending that post command out, and automatically the server would respond back and say, okay, wait another 900 seconds. So not a whole lot was happening right there until we started taking over and actually intercepting things. Any questions on the demo so far? Anything you want to add? No. Oh, question? Good. Oh, good. <laughs> Oh, okay. There's a question. Yes. If, if you're not on the cell phone network, you have an Android device that's attached through the internet, the Wi-Fi, let's say, will this more routers traffic over the, the uh, Wi-Fi? Some of its traffic. It uses uh, also some SMS messages, which will not get routed over Wi-Fi. And that's true of a couple of different bots. There's some that use exclusively SMS for the CNC. This one you would still see, like these HTTP hosts, yeah, you would still see that over Wi-Fi. Yep. Okay, so let's dig into Stells in a little more detail and walk through this um, a little more slowly. All right. So here you see the text message we sent, hey, check this out, sneakynet.com. And here's, welcome to SneakyNet, would you like some candy? We just saw that. And unfortunately, David clicked on the link, uh -huh. got his phone infected. And we saw this, uh, this first alert in there. It went by pretty quick. Um, there was an alert on the malware file name, flashplayer.android.update.apk, because it appeared in that website. So if you have users in your environment or if you're, you yourself are on your home network, you could see this alert pop up before you're even infected. And here's the, uh, I think I'm going to have to pop down there again so I can see this. Sorry. Sorry, sound guys. All right, so here you see the Android file name. It's actually part of the GET request right here, the HTTP GET. So it's buried in there. And it's cool because you can see Wireshark didn't dissect this, again, because it's probably one of the 8881 GRE packets. Um, but you can see the 4500, the IP address, the 0050, which means it's port 80, and that correlates with the get bad girl flash player dot android dot update dot apk. The second snort alert that popped up was an alert on the malware binary snippet, the first 42 bytes. So after that get request happened, we saw the first 42 bytes come up, and that came up multiple times, actually. Here it is um, in Wireshark. Now, because this was uh, coming the other way, this was an inbound instead of an outbound uh, HTTP message, uh, it, Wireshark actually dissected it to a much greater level. We actually see the IP there. We actually see the TCP there. It didn't get the HTTP, um, but you can see here the start of the Android Stells malware binary, that PK that indicates it's a Windows executable file. So then you saw the Flash Player with the nice Flash Player icon. That means it's safe and really from Adobe. Uh, download it onto the phone. And David used the package installer to install it. Here's a clearer version of what it was trying to do. 
Do we want to allow this application to see our messages, read your contact information? We'll show you how we, we controlled it to send out our contact information. It had full internet access. It had access to the storage on the, on the smartphone. Services that cost you money. So it can call premium numbers and it can send text messages to premium numbers. And it can read the phone status and ID. Do you want to install this application? Why, yes, we do. Application installed. Here's what it looked like when it was uh, first installed on the desktop. Then we got this message that said, your Android version does not support this update. Setup is canceled. And then, boom, that was gone. But as you saw, it was still running in the background. Your mic's not on, David. No, no, go ahead. Honestly, I think they gave up at this point. The malware <laughs> authors, they're like, oh, they're pwned now. We don't have to make it look pretty. They just put a white screen with text at that point. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so again, the user cannot tell that the phone is infected. This is invisible to the end user. And while this is going on, we saw the possible CNC server traffic, and we were alerting on that IP address, just presenting itself as a string inside, the, um, inside a packet. Here you can see. Uh, here you can see a DNS response. So before it starts talking to that CNC server the first time, it has to do a DNS request for the domain, and then it's going to get a DNS response. In the request, the domain was broken up. In the response, it wasn't, so we saw the alert on the response. And it's kind of interesting that Wireshark actually does dissect this properly. So we see PPP, and then IP, and then UDP, and then it did get the highest layer protocol, DNS. So a challenge to the audience. I will mail you a Ninja Duck if you fix these protocol dissectors. Yeah. <laughs> That's totally worth it. <laughs> um, and we saw the earlier DNS request did not. Here's the fragmentation right there. There's the domain, and you can see it's cut off. .fr something something. The rest is in the next packet. OK, so here is an HTTP post. Um, this HTTP post message is the actual Stell's uh, command and control traffic. This is what the phone home message looks like when it's talking to the attacker's server in the Netherlands. So you can see here uh, PPP, Wireshark didn't dissect it, but you can see post slash data dot PHP. This post message was broken up across 23 packets, and I had to reassemble them manually, which was a real pain. Um, here's, what it, here's the first half of it. It's pretty long. Uh, it has that, that um, unique multi-part boundary right here, AABO3X, and that's pretty easy to alert on. You can just stick that into Snort. Uh, it sends the IMEI, the IMSI, so you can tell the phone's number from the post to the attacker, and the attacker can tell that. Um, information about the phone, the version, what time it thinks it is. Also, the name bot ID and some other stuff in there, Samsung, the manufacturer. So it sends a bunch of information about, the bot sends a bunch of information about itself to the attacker every 15 minutes or however long the attacker tells it. And we can see that happening here. Snort alerted on it successfully. I alerted on the string bot ID. I also alerted on that unique multi part boundary in an HTTP post. Here's the, here's the server's response. So the server is going to get this post message and start sending commands in response. It's just a, it's a very simple thing. We actually, there's no authentication here between the infected bot and the server. We've seen uh, malware more complex and more sophisticated since 1999 when I think it was the Babylonia worm came out. We've had authentication. So here, IP, TCP, HTTP. Wireshark actually got the HTTP this time. This is an incoming message from uh, the attacker server in the Netherlands. And here's, if you reassemble it, here's what it looks like. Remove all SMS filters, true, OK, wait 60. So it's telling it only wait 60 seconds and then talk to me again. And then it changed the server address. So that's kind of cool. Scott will talk to you a little bit more about it. It can send lots of other commands as well. Pretty much anything in, that, in this, let's see, I have a list here. Pretty much anything in this list, send SMS. Uh, the server can tell to send an SMS message. It can tell to delete an SMS message. It can tell to open a URL, send a contact list out to the attacker so it can read all of your contacts, or just update itself. Make call is the last one. It can make phone calls without you knowing about it. Where were we? 
Okay, so remove all SMS filters. We put some of those commands into Snort, and Snort will alert individually on each of the commands. So you'll have a log of exactly what your malware was doing if you set it up this way. And then again, after it received that change of server, we then saw a DNS query and response for the new server name, and we saw a corresponding alert to go along with it. So the bot sent a post to the new server then, uh, over in the Netherlands, and it received a new response. This time that second server said, remove all SMS filters, true, wait 900. So instead of telling it wait 60 seconds, the new server said wait 900 seconds every 15 minutes. This would still be pretty easy to see if you were watching your traffic in an enterprise. Um, every 15 minutes is still pretty noisy on the network, but the attacker could tell it wait a month, and it wouldn't phone back for a month, and that would be a lot harder to detect. So here's a screenshot. Our, our, uh, our cellular intrusion detection system, CIDS, was successful. We alerted on the initial infection. We alerted on every phone home that the bot made to the attacker. And you can use this same method to detect smart, infected smartphones in your environment, whether you're at home or whether you're at work. So now Randy Price is going to talk about the device forensic analysis. were we able to see SMS messages and dissect them and set up a fake SMS server. We do have SMS traffic. Uh, I'm sorry, a fake CMC server. Um, we do have SMS traffic. We haven't really had too much time to play with it, but that is definitely the next step that we're going to be poking around with when we get home. I'm hoping Tom Ritter will lend us his SMS dissector. The thing about the SMS is that it's there, it's not encrypted, but it's encoded. It's like reverse seven byte or something. Uh, don't quote me on that, but yeah. As far as the CNC, we'll get to that in just a sec. Okay. After capturing traffic from the infected phones, we conducted device forensic analysis. The forensic analysis corroborated findings from our network forensics analysis. We took a physical extraction of the Samson illusion with the Celebrite UFED and the that the phone after the phone had been infected in the testing lab. Please note that the okay. Sorry. Okay. Please note. Is that better? Okay. Please note that the infected, ins, the infecting and the in extraction were performed with an RF shielded test enclosure, which is shown here. Okay. The Celebrite physical analyzer was used to analyze the extraction. The malware scanner identified four potentially malicious files, which are shown here. The Celebrate malware scanner identified all of the suspicious files as Android Trojan fake app K. We recovered each of the files and took the SHA-1 cryptographic checksums. We confirmed that these SHA-1 sums matched the cryptographic checksums for the Android Stells malware reported in the Dell SecureWorks Stells Android Trojan malware analysis report. We found a file called Stell's settings XML, which appeared to contain malware configuration settings. As you can see from the configuration file, each bot is assigned a bot ID. This allows the bot herder to manage the bots under their control. The server listed is the command and control server that instructs the bot where to, where to phone home to. The period value of 300 seconds or five minutes is the initial phone home interval. This tells the bot to phone home every five minutes. Thank you. All right. Good morning, DEF CON. I'm super stoked to see so many of you guys out here for 10 a.m. on a Saturday. Anyway, I'm going to hop down here. I like to walk around and use my laser. What's that? There you go, stronger ones. All right. So because of the research that Randy did with the uh, UFED 
and we were able to determine the way that Stealth is communicating back to its command and control server. We knew that we knew the address of the command and control server, so we also knew that you know kind of what we're looking for. So let's be a man in the middle. When we want to do man in the middle attack against this, I had to set up a proxy so we could tunnel the, the traffic back through there. So enter my favorite tool for doing web testing, uh, Burp Suite Professional. To set this up, we had to tunnel all the traffic, as I said, through Burp Suite, and we were really looking at that port 80 traffic over HTTP. Just to be sure that I was getting all the packets, I decided to root the Android device that we were using. When I do mobile application penetration testing, I usually take a rooted device uh, in, just in order to get all the SSL encrypted packets as well, because I wasn't sure perhaps Stells is using you know, two forms of, of communication, and we just weren't seeing that encrypted portion of that. Doing that on an Android phone is kind of interesting. You have to install your own root certificate authority to the device itself. But to do that, you have to do even more work. So you have to use an outdated version of OpenSSL. I think I was using version 0.98. I think that shipped with Ubuntu 10.04 originally, which is the virtual machine I set up to, to do that on. You have to create an MD5 hash calculation of the subject line of the certificate, append a dot zero to that, and then install that into the uh, several uh, files down in the system directory of the Android device. And to do that, you have to have root on the device. Once I had root, I remounted slash system as read write and then installed that certificate to the correct place. And now we can see all the traffic running through that phone, no matter if it's a web application, if it's a, uh, you know, just a, a, a mobile banking app. I can see all the traffic running through and actually intercept that using my proxy. In this case, I didn't have to end up doing that. The, all the traffic was going over uh, port 80 HTTP completely unencrypted. And let's take a look here. We turn on intercept, of course. So what I saw was, what Shoya had alluded to over here, we see remove all SMS filters, true. So it's not listening on that. It's using the, the HTTP method. It's saying wait 60, so it's telling it to wait 60 seconds before calling back. And we're seeing it set the command and control server here. So I got to thinking, well, I wonder if it's going to be this easy. All I had to do was replace the command and control server with a server that I own, and now my device is going to be calling back to me. So I did that. Told it to wait 60. I still sent the remove all SMS filters true. And then I decided to wait. We got 60 seconds. Sure enough, it worked, and now it's calling back to me instead of the actual CNC server. Now, the server that I set up didn't actually send <laughs> commands or do any control stuff. It would just get a 404 error. When the bot actually receives that 404 error, it does a timeout, and then you have to wait five minutes until you can actually start communicating with it again. So I was like, well, this is kind of troublesome. It's going to take me way more time to do my research. So instead, I just continued to keep intercepting all of the requests and telling it to wait 60 or wait 5 or wait 30, uh, depending on what I was trying to do. I did find out that when I tried to set it to you know, wait two, wait five seconds, it would start going so fast that it would eventually time out, and then it would wait between five and 15 minutes before calling out again. So that was even less helpful. <laughs> you can also uh, adjust it for you know, more extended periods of time. If you want to you know, take a break and go out to lunch, you can set an hour. I found that pretty helpful. So controlling stealth, I wanted to see if we could actually tell it to export that, that uh, contact list from the device. And sure enough, you can. I just had to set send contact list true, wait 60 seconds. And 60 seconds later, we see it send out that contact information. As you can see at the bottom of the page here, I actually got all of the phone numbers off of that device. And you can, read, you can read that. It sent it right back to the attacker over here. And had I not changed that command and control server, the attacker now has all the contacts in my device, and they're probably now going to use those contacts to infect more phones. I find this to be really helpful, say, if you're in an enterprise environment. I don't know how many of you guys have to manage IT where you're from. But if you have a device on your network, you know it's infected because we have a cellular IDS now. It's not always easy to find that device. And on top of that, you may have a BYOD policy where you've got employees coming in that own their own device, and now you can't actually gain access to it to clean that malware off. Using this method, we never even touch the device, and we actually protect that user by cutting off the head of the snake, so to speak. If the, if the attacker is no longer communicating with that device, the attacker is not going to be able to steal that data. This buys us a lot of time to actually track that device down, get the appropriate permission, and get that virus cleaned off of there. Nice. Thank you, Scott. So that pretty much concludes our presentation. As you saw, we were able to infect an Android phone with Stells, just as a demonstration. 
We detected the infection uh, and the command and control channel, so both pieces of that, and no agent was actually needed on the device in order to do this. We could have shut this down remotely without installing anything. This was all for $285 and a little bit of pixie dust, which you guys have now. Um, and of course, if you wanted to get a beefier server, you certainly could. Again, here's that parts list. Uh, all you need is a femto cell, some kind of system, whether it's a laptop or a super old Dell Optiplex or whatever it is, a hub or a switch, and then some cables. Thank you all so much. Um, we're going to take questions. If anyone wants uh, to, to see the demo a little bit closer up, uh, what room are we going to be in afterwards? Uh, we're going to be tearing down in the... We're going to tear down and then we're going to move somewhere else. Um, so feel free to come visit us. lmgsecurity.com slash blog.